Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I'm going to go ahead and turn my video back on. Hello, I am your host, Shady Rose from Lost City Books. And tonight we are welcoming Professor Manal A. Jamal and Zaha Hassan to discuss promoting democracy. I'll tell you a little bit about who we have with us tonight. First, of course, Lost City Books. Uh, the page that you're on right now is owned by Adam, who is a veteran and dog lover, for those of you who don't know, and a longtime resident of DC and an enthusiastic disseminator of books. Our close knit team is a collection of some of DC's coolest kids, uh, and I hope that applies to me as well. We have artists, educators, musicians, writers, and of course, avid readers all coming together to enrich this unique environment. I'm your host, Shady Rose, and uh, you might know that this book is available on the shelves right now at Lost City Books. So if you like what you hear and what you see tonight, be sure to, uh, to hop on over to the store and grab a copy for yourself. 
Dr. Manal A. Jamal is a professor of political science at James Madison University. So some of you watching right now may have met her before. She's widely published and has held research fellowship positions at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and at UC Berkeley's Center for Middle Eastern Studies. During the late 1990s, she worked as a researcher and journalist in the Palestinian territories. She's lived in DC since 2008. And I've had the pleasure of meeting her a few times and we've had some great conversations. So you all are in for a treat. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about promoting democracy. Promoting democracy, the force of political settlements in uncertain times. Uh, this is a little bit about the, the book that we're gonna be discussing tonight. So all of you tuning in right now, um, make sure that you are paying close attention and get some questions ready because we will have a Q&A at the end of this program. Democracy promotion is a central pillar of the foreign policy of many states, but the results are often disappointing. In promoting democracy, Dr. Manal A. Jamal examines why these efforts succeed in some countries but fail in others. A former journalist and researcher in the Palestinian territories, as we just mentioned, she offers an up-close perspective of the, of the ways in which Western donor funding has, on one hand, undermined political participation in cases such as the Palestinian territories and on the other hand, succeeded in bolstering political engagement in cases such as El Salvador. Uh, this amazing piece of work is based on five field work trips in over 150 interviews, which I did mention to Manal earlier is an incredible number of interviews uh, with grassroots activists, political leaders and directors and program officers in donor agencies and NGOs. Jamal brings into focus an often overlooked perspective, the experiences of those directly effect affected by this assistance. And I know this subject is something that has been on the minds of a lot of our uh, wonderful readers here uh, at Lost City Books and also in the city of DC. So I'm really excited to get into this conversation. Zaha Hassan is a human rights lawyer and visiting fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Her research fo focus is on Palestine-Israel peace the use of international legal mechanisms by political movements and US foreign policy in the region. Previously, she was the coordinator and se senior legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team during Palestine's bid for UN membership and was a member of the Palestinian delegation to quartet sponsored exploratory talks between 2011 and 2012. She regularly participates in track two peace efforts and is a contributor to the Hill and, how do, how do we say this, Zaha Hartez? Ha Haaretz. <laughs> Haaretz, thank you. Her commentaries have appeared in the New York Times, Salon, Al Jazeera English, CNN, and others. So we are going all out with a really great uh, collection here and I will stop sharing for the time being. And now I'd like to bring on our guests of honor tonight, uh, Dr. Manal A. Jamal and Zaha Hassan if you'd like to say hello to our audience and uh, give a little introduction to yourself tonight. Well, thank you for that very generous introduction. So um, I, I don't have much to add, um, but, but thank you very much also for organizing this event. And thank you, Zaha, for joining this event. I, I know how busy you are, so, um, so I really appreciate um, that you were able to join. Um, and also special thanks to Lost City Books uh, for, um, for hosting this event. Lost City Books is one of my favorite bookstores in, in DC. And um, I would have loved for this to be an in-person event, um, but alas, um, here we are, it's almost February and we're still um, in this pandemic. Um, but thankfully the end is in sight and I'm, I'm very grateful that we're able to have this event. And I'm very grateful to everyone who's able to join uh, tonight on this cold Friday night. Um, so, you know, hopefully we're going to have an interesting uh, discussion. Um, what I'm going to do in the next uh, 15 minutes or so is uh, just discuss um, what inspired this book, um, discuss what I do in this book and some of my key findings, and then what we could delve into all these issues in a bit more detail um, during the, during the Q&A. Um, the main question I address in this book is why do democracy promotion efforts succeed in some cases and fail in others? Um, and what, what inspired this book, 
um, actually dates back to a few decades ago. Um, during the late 1990s, as you mentioned in your introduction, I was working um, in the Palestinian territories as a researcher and as a journalist. And one of the main uh, research projects I was working on was on uh, donor assistance to Palestine. Um, as you might know, um, in 1993, the PLO and Israel signed a peace, uh, peace agreement or started peace negotiations. They signed um, the, the the Oslo Accords. And after that, there was this massive influx of foreign aid to the Palestinian territories. Um, but what became evident to me and to others who, who were there and observing, you know, um, and a, trying to, to get a sense of what's happening with this influx of aid is that despite the sizable allocations of foreign aid to the Palestinian territories, despite um, the, the amount of aid that was going to the building of infrastructure, to humanitarian relief, um, and especially to democracy promotion efforts, um, this aid was not having a positive impact. Um, the majority of Palestinians um, were not affected by this aid. Their life uh, was not improved uh, by this aid. Moreover, um, the substantial allocations to democracy promotion um, were not leading uh, to more positive democratic outcomes. They weren't leading to a, a stronger civil society. Um, on the contrary, it seemed like prospects for democracy were weakening. Um, and very importantly, um, there was actually a weakening in civil society and in political organizing. And this was not expected. Um, because in, by way of background, um, the Palestinians had done an amazing job um, in the late 1970s throughout the 1980s, and then culminating um, in the first intifada in 1987, um, in terms of the kind of grassroots organizing they were able to do. Um, Palestinians initiated and coordinated mass organization um, and established grassroots organizations throughout the occupied territories in the remotest villages, in the smallest uh, towns. Um, they were able to establish um, you know, uh, labor unions, women's organizations, student groups, professional syndicates. So there was this true mobilization of Palestinian society um, and they were able to involve hundreds of thousands of individuals. And as I said, this, this organizing culminates during the first intifada. The first intifada takes its, its episode of uh, mass, up, uh, coordinated mass upheaval um, to, to end Israeli occupation. And it takes place from 1987 to 1993. And you know, all of Palestinian society is mobilized and in, involved in, in these efforts. And so the expectation was, given this significant, tremendous legacy of grassroots organizing, and now given these new enabling circumstances, there is, you know, um, there's less milit Israeli military on the street. Um, there's this positive outlook that perhaps something's going to come out of this peace agreement. There's this influx of aid um, to support, you know, the, these efforts that there would be uh, there would be a strengthening of these types of organizations and more uh, positive prospects for democratization. But as I said, on the contrary, that did not happen. And actually, these organizations demobilized. Um, these organizations um, and just Palestinian society in general became much more polarized and there was less political engagement and um, civic engagement. And so many of us, not only me as a researcher, but acad other academics, um, policymakers, even the activists themselves um, were trying to explain um, what led to um, the, these unanticipated outcomes. And so everyone's trying to explain what's happening at that time. And one of the key explanations um, that was put forth um, by, by many um, was this idea of NGO professionalization. Okay. And they were used, basically the, the, this was the explanation to explain this, these unanticipated outcomes. And according to this explanation, NGO professionalization is once there's this influx of aid organizations are required to um, undergo a host of organizational changes. They're required to professionalize their operations. They're 
required to establish professionalized pay scales. They're required to, um, you know, to hire English speaking employees who can write the reports to the donors. They're required to hire, um, uh, you know, people who are going to write the grants. So it's not simply about getting the aid, but it's about continuing to get the aid. And so these organizations ultimately become more accountable to the donors who fund them rather than their, their membership and the constituents they're supposed to serve and the, their former grassroots-based organizations. And so people accepted this as the explanation as to what had happened in Palestine. Um, and I was not entirely convinced by this explanation. And one of the reasons I wasn't convinced is um, there was another case I was uh, familiar with that had similar or shared similar circumstances as the Palestinian case and ended up with different circumstances. Um, and so I started to study this case in a bit more detail. This case is El Salvador. Um, similar to the Palestinian territories, um, the, um, the FMLN had um, engaged in massive grassroots mobilization during the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, and they were, they, uh, El Salvador was a highly mobilized society, especially not only in terms of the political military organizations, but at this grassroots level. Also, um, in El Salvador, there is a signing of a peace agreement in 1992, although in El Salvador, it's between um, the FMLN and the government, so it's internal. It's not like the Palestinian case where it's, uh, you know, uh, between uh, the PLO and in, in Israel. In, El Salvador, there was a civil war and you have the signing of the peace agreements, which is internal. Um, and then after the signing of the peace agreements in 1992, there's a massive influx of aid. Um, however, what transpires in El Salvador um, is there isn't this the same weakening, there is not the same uh, demobilization in El Salvador um, that, that we witnessed in the Palestinian case. Um, actually, the organizations, they do professionalize um, their operations, but they're still required to be engaged with their grassroots. And so it was these initial observations that shaped the book project. And then I started to do even more research and like, you know, examining the theoretical literature um, and, you know, what others have done on this topic. And I was even more dissatisfied. So I, I decided, okay, this definitely is going to be the topic I'm going to study. Um, and so what I decided I would do with the book is I would systemic, systematically examine the influx of aid um, to the Palestinian territories and El Salvador. And I would first look at how this aid impacts um, elections, both at the national level and at the local level, um, not in only in terms of the, the outcomes of the elections, but also in terms of the, the changing of the laws that have to do, you know, related to the elections. And then, and this is, I think, my more important contribution, is I systematically examined what happens after there's this influx of aid. Who receives the aid? Who does not receive the aid? Um, and then what do the groups that receive the aid do with the aid? And how do the groups begin to interact with one another? And I would do this in El Salvador and, um, and the Palestinian territories. Um, and I would focus, um, I would look at this at a macro level, but then focus um, specifically on the women's sector in both cases and to really examine how the women's sec sector is transformed um, it, you know, because of this influx of aid. And throughout this, um, throughout this research project, my main focus and what I tried to do, and I, I hope I did it successfully, was to give voice to um, those who are most affected by this aid. Because when this research is often done, the focus is on the donor agencies, it's on the political leaders, and I wanted to give voice to those voices, to those individuals who are often overlooked um, in this type of research. Um, as you mentioned, um, I conducted over 150 interviews. Um, this was with grassroots activists, it was with political leaders, it's with directors of NGOs, directors of donor agencies. And so um, what I found and what was critical, I thought, in terms of my, my key finding is that actually it was inadequate to simply go into a context and say, I want to look at the impact of aid. Um, we needed to take the analysis a step back and really 
intimately become familiar with the political context and uh, to understand really how politics operates in this context, and then to better understand how the political context will shape the impact of the assistance. And what I found, um, and this became my, uh, this comes the argument I developed, is that the key difference in the Palestinian case and the Salvadoran case was the political settlement. And by political settlement, I'm referring broad to, broadly to the formal and the informal political agreements in a given context that shapes um, you know, political relations. Um, and it also shapes democracy promotion efforts. And what I'm specifically concerned with is a level of inclusivity, the extent to which all political groups are included, and also uh, the extent to which a political settlement enjoys uh, you know, support in a given context. And this is the key difference in these two cases. Um, in the Palestinian case, from the onset, the Oslo Accords is a very non-inclusive political settlements. Only uh, one key political party was a signatory, and even later, when political organizations are brought in or what, what have you, um, there's a lot of opposition um, to, to the political agreement. Um, there, there's a groups that you know, adopt a wait and see approach and they're trying to figure out what to do you know, at, during this transition. Um, there are groups that are strongly opposed and they, they can't even access donor aid if they wanted to. Because remember the donor aid that comes in to Palestine, this massive influx, is to promote the peace agreement. And so what this ultimately means is that different groups have different access to the aid, different groups have different access to political institutions, different groups um, are included in a different way. And so what transpires is this fragmentation um, and polarization between the different groups that extends, it, goes, it applies to the main political organizations, but extends to their grassroots organizations, everything that would or, was organized before. That's not what happens in El Salvador. In El Salvador, you have a much, uh, a, a, a much less fragmented process. All the key political organizations um, either took part in the negotiations or were part of an inter-party commission later and endorsed uh, the, the, the peace agreements. So they're included in this transition. They have a say in the transition. Um, they have the same access to institutions to engage the state. They have the same opportunity to play in, in the, the, the democratic, uh, to shape the democratic rules of the game, to take part in the democratic life of the country. And their grassroots organizations have the same access to resources whether it's local resources or foreign aid. And so it's a much more coherent process. What I go into detail then in the book is I show how this plays out um, in, in really in the women's sector in, in detail. I do this more generally, but I show it um, in, in the women's sector. And so what I focus on is who's included and who's not, which organizations, um, you know, are seen as somehow supportive of the Oslo Accords and can access foreign aid. What do they do with this aid? What organizations are unable to? And then I examine the kind of relationships that transpire between these groups. Um, then what I also examine is because of the political settlement, um, what kind of foreign aid actually is prioritized by the foreign donors? And what are the amounts? And what we find is given the significance of Palestine, Israel to donors, it's geostrategic importance to the donors. There's a much higher influx of aid and it's bilateral aid by state sponsored donors. And their focus is much more political. Okay? That is not the case in um, El Salvador. Um, there still is a significant influx of aid in El Salvador but it's not to the extent of the Palestinian case. But in general, this is, at, this is post the end of the Cold War. So the aid is much less political to El Salvador. There's much more focus on really developing um, the, um, the, the government institutions, um, specifically um, a, a focus on government administration. There is also a lot more focus on economic development. 
and on local government in El Salvador and the way that we don't find um, in, in the Palestinian case. And then what I go into detail, and I, I, I'd rather probably, I think, discuss this in more detail in the Q&A, is this idea of what develops our articulated spaces or you know, disarticulated spaces and how there's this focus on local government in the Salvadoran case that we don't have in the Palestinian case. But in El Salvador, it's also, it's not only about funding organizations, but it's ensuring that there's patterns of interaction that continue after this aid ends. Like, you know, what are they going to do with the aid? Are they engaging local government? Um, that does not take place in the Palestinian case, because in Palestine, you're always worried what happens if there's elections and opposition wins elections. So they ignore the local government, uh, local level. And I could elaborate on this in the Q&A. Um, so what I do then in the book, I, I, I look at um, how the influx of aid um, impacts the women's sector in both cases, and I look at it in, in detail. Um, but then I expand um, the, the temporal and geographic aperture of the study. And I look at what happens after Hamas wins the elections in 2006. Hamas is an opposition party that opposed the Oslo Accords. Um, but I want to make, I want to emphasize, uh, and, I, and double emphasize actually, that Hamas is not the only organization that opposed the Oslo Accords. And it's not like, it's not, there are other organizations that also opposed. And so it's not simply about the is radical Islamists, but there are leftists, secular leftists that oppose the Oslo Accords for all sorts of reasons. Um, and we could, I could elaborate on this chapter also in the Q&A. Um, and then in terms of expanding the geographic aperture, I look at um, developments in Iraq and South Africa. Um, I, don't, I don't examine uh, these developments in the same detail that I do in the Palestinian territories in El Salvador. Um, but I do look how, at how in South Africa, we have an inclusive political settlement. All groups are included. The influx of aid is not as divisive. Um, it doesn't lead to the same kind of polarization. And very importantly, the ANC was adamant about um, not accepting like aid that was that was politicized and conditional. Um, that was the stark opposite of what took place in Iraq. Um, in Iraq, you also have a very non-inclusive uh, transition after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. Um, you know, entire po political segments of society are excluded. There's this massive debactification. Uh, where anyone who was even remotely almost, uh, not remotely, but at certain levels of the Ba'ath Party, whether they were educators or teachers or worked in hospitals are excluded from the political life of the country. And so from the onset, you begin um, you know, with this democratization process in Iraq with this non-inclusivity. Um, and so I'm going to end here and then I could elaborate on anything I raised um, in, our, in our discussion. Absolutely, thank you so much for that overview. I think that um, any viewers who are really curious about this book and about what your, your work is are gonna have a much better idea of what, what, uh, what you've been studying uh, with, this, with this project. Um, it sounds to me like you have a really robust uh, sort of double case study of, of two extremes of the same, um, the same effort in different parts of the world, of course. Uh, and I'm curious to, to learn a little bit more about the focus on the women's sector. Um, I'm just going to list a few things that I'm curious about and, and we can keep moving in. And then Zaha, if you would like to um, jump in as well. Um, I'm definitely curious to learn more about the focus on the women's sector, uh, which is definitely an often neglected um, sector when in studying these types of impact, despite the fact that it could be said to be common knowledge that uh, women are some of the strongest drivers of political action um, across the world as a group. Uh, additionally, um, the differences between the Palestinian uh, grassroots movements and the, and the El Salvadorian grassroots movements and how they were approached with this aid, um, I think it would be great to expand on that a little bit more. Excellent. Those are excellent questions. And actually, they're, uh, they're questions I had anticipated in the book, because when I first started thinking about it and discussing it, those were the types of questions I would always get. And um, the reason I decided to focus on the women's sector um, is 
I decided very early on that I was not going to write this book for Palestine specialists. I wanted to write this book for someone who's interested in these issues on democracy promotion, on, um, on, on civil society, on democratization. Um, and I wanted to write it for someone who actually didn't know much about Palestine and the Palestinian women's sector and the Palestinian women's movement. Um, and so if we actually look at the literature on Palestine, there actually is a, quite a bit written on the women's sector in Palestine and women's activism, but it tends to be the same people reading that literature, those specialists. And so when I decided to do this comparison, to many people it seemed counterintuitive, is why would you compare Palestine and El Salvador and the women's sector and Palestine and El Salvador, and they must be so different. And what I showed in this book, I hope uh, successfully, is that actually the women's sectors were not that different. Actually, there's a lot more commonality um, in terms of the way they organized, also in terms of women's socioeconomic status, the key difference between the two cases in terms of women's socioeconomic status is the uh, women's employment rate. There is a lot, um, women are much more involved in the labor sector in El Salvador compared to Palestine. But I think there's other odd things going on in Palestine where there's just, uh, there's less involvement in the labor sector as a whole for both, for, for, for everyone in general. And so, um, yeah, that was one of the, uh, the motivations for looking at the women's sector was to educate people who don't know much about Palestine, who don't know what much about the women's movement and women's, this, leg, this uh, rich legacy of women's organizing in the Palestinian territories, and would suddenly pick up this book and be surprised that it really, um, you know, about, by this rich legacy and that the similarities between other cases such as um, El Salvador. And so there's tables there where I, I, I draw the similarities and I, the data, what have you. Um, and also in terms of the women's organizing, I, I initially I knew there were some you know, similarities and to me it was over, it was really, um, even to me it was a surprise about how similar the modes of grassroots organizing uh, were in both contexts. Um, the key difference was that in the Palestinian territories, the leaders of the women's movement were, um, they, they were not necessarily involved uh, or not seldom involved in the military organizations. And that was not the case in El Salvador. Many of the key leaders of the women's sector and the women's movement were um, involved in, um, often were involved also in the military organizations. Does that, does that answer? I can go on, so does that? That, that definitely answers my question, um, or at the very least scratches the surface. And I, I'm sure that uh, our viewers right now are eager to, to scratch deeper. And, 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 um, and I actually would like to jump in on this because this was what I was interested to. Um, I should say first, thank you, Shady, for inviting me to share in the conversation um, with Manal, whose book, I have to say, I'm a consumer of her work. Um, in my own work. So I really was happy to be able to um, participate with you and, and uh, talking to her about the book. I should offer this disclaimer too. Um, Manal and I are high school mates from Palestine. Um, <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we were in high school together in the lead up to the first Palestinian uprising in 1987. So now you know how old I am too. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Manal, you may not have wanted people I to it's all good. It's all the uh, people can Google it, right? So. Um, you know, I lost almost three months of my senior year um, in high school to protests and demonstrations and curfews, but it was the most amazing time of my life. And at the outset, it was it was young women um, and schoolgirls who led the protests because the men and the boys were more likely to be shot at or have their bones broken by soldiers as per orders of the uh, Israeli Minister of Defense, who was at that time none other than the Nobel Laureate and peacemaker Yitzhak Rabin. Um, I was struck in your book, Manal, about the women's activism, just like Shady was. I'm, can you talk about women organizers in Palestine, how their role in the first uprising changed over time with the influence of the Islamic movement, Hamas, and and how did the signing of the interim agreement between Israel and the PLO change women's role in civil society and their movement 
uh, as they moved into government, some of them at least, at least the ones and um, associated with the Fatah faction. Excellent question. Um, just to, to backtrack, um, when I went to interview the woman, um, what I focused on um, in terms of who I was going to interview was, um, was women who were involved um, in the period during the Intifada or before the Intifada, and they were activists then, and that continued to be activists afterwards, um, after the signing of the Oslo Accords. And I wanted these, I wanted to hear their insights on, um, you know, how things had changed and how their own personal experiences had changed. Um, and that's, um, and, and the stories were fascinating. And I still, I mean, I, I'm very proud of the book I produced, but I always felt I could have done more um, with, with the amazing interviews I had. Um, what many of the women felt um, is that, um, you know, during this period before the Intifada, leading up to this Intifada, um, there's a sense of empowerment. And I, I don't mean to, rom I really don't mean to romanticize it and say that, you know, everything was perfect and that, you know, there weren't, um, the women were not struggling with, you know, sometimes they're getting directives from the main, the political organizations, but there's a sense of empowerment where they're organizing, they're establishing their grassroots committees. In many of these places, they're deciding on their agendas. They, they're deciding if they want to focus on establishing, um, you know, uh, uh, the production of, for you know, food co cooperatives. They're deciding on whether they want to establish economic cooperatives. They're deciding if they want to focus on literacy. They're deciding on the types of lectures that they want to give to, to the woman in the, the town. And so there's, there's a sense of empowerment in terms of deter, you know, the sense of agency um, that the women um, felt they possessed. And then, one of the key changes that takes place after this influx of aid is that the, um, many of these organizations um, professionalize their operations. So the leaders you know, become heads of professionalized NGOs and they're still uh, you know, uh, holding these amazing, very interesting events. But these former organizers are invited as, you know, to attend these lectures, these seminars, these workshops. And so they're still trying to include these women, but these women are included in a different way. And many of them complained about this where they felt they had been um, prior, they had been the organizers, they had been you know, determining their programs. And suddenly they became the recipients of you know, the skill training. They became the, the, the people to attend these seminars. Um, the training sessions were about democracy, were about, um, you know, women's empowerment. And there was this, there was, there was such discontent with this. And I don't know if in hindsight, like women are also romanticizing what their experience was, you know, during the Intifada or before, but a lot of the women expressed a lot of dismay with these changes and how they felt, because they felt that they'd been transformed from active participants in their own organizations to the recipients of skill training. And there's amazing quotes um, in, in the book where, you know, women are discussing saying, look, I mean, I go to these training sessions, don't they know that I know what democracy is and what my rights are and what empowerment is? And um, so the, the, this was almost a theme and this wasn't only, this was almost across the board for the grassroots organizers. Um, with the political leaders of Fetih, it was different. I mean, this is the included political organization because they are, they're taking part in government. Um, they are um, involved in a different way. They also had access to resources. So they don't feel, they didn't feel they're losing out in the same way. Um, but for the grassroots organizers, they really, this was, um, this was expressed, this discontent was expressed by all the organizers. Um, though, in one of the questions I would ask them, I'd say, you know, you seem so unhappy. Why do you go to these training sessions still? And many of them, and those answers were interesting too. Many of them would say things like, you know, there's, we go see our friends. It's our opportunity to socialize. I mean, there's donor funding. So the lunches are much fancier. Um, but unfortunately, uh, many of the women were uh, very, very dismayed with the, with the changes and their role. But Zaha, you also mentioned Hamas, and um, with Ham Hamas, the 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 in Hamas per se does not have women members, right? But there's Islamist women, 
and they're, they were doing their own organizing, doing their own thing. Um, there's often, you know, sometimes they're included in these activities, sometimes they're not. Um, but they're still doing a lot of the grassroots stuff that the other organizations were, um, were, were, were doing before. But they're not, um, you could say there's a kind of bifurcation where the Islamist women are doing their own thing and the other, you know, women's groups, whether they're pro-Oslo or not, are doing their own thing. Is that also, just quickly, um, is that also because of the fact that there are certain restrictions on, on aid um, in which uh, you know members of uh, designated terrorist organizations are not allowed to participate in certain programming, USAID, for example, USAID programming um, that uh, uh, for for uh, promotion of democracy and, and good governance, they wouldn't allow certain people that had affiliations with um, Hamas to participate, which kind of goes against the whole point of uh, democracy promotion and well, inclusion and civic engagement. But can you talk a little bit about how that kind of skewed outcomes a bit? Definitely. And it wasn't actually, it wasn't only Hamas. Um, with USAID in the early 2000s um, put in place policies that even if you were related to someone who was affiliated with or imprisoned or with a political organization um, that was seen, you know, as as uh, was on a U.S. terrorist list, and not only Hamas is on a U.S. terrorist list, most Palestinian political organizations are. Um, you could not be, um, you could not even be an employee in an organization. Um, so that 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 was very problematic because in Palestinian society, I mean, these these divisions are not so clear cut. Um, but in terms of the women, the women, by definition, the women are not formal members of Hamas. So that did not necessarily apply, but the vetting took place in terms of the employees and who's on the boards of the organizations. Um, but for, in terms of the women um, attending these events, sometimes they are invited, um, but sometimes they really, they were doing their own thing. And many of them, actually, the Islamist women who I, uh, I, I um, interviewed, they felt that they weren't, that they necessarily weren't welcome to these events, but more for um, the, you know, there was just, they weren't secular. And so the, the women's movement as a whole had a more secular agenda. And so they felt even if they were invited, it was just kind of out of formality. And they also felt that, um, and they said they, in terms of funding, that they had, um, some of them had tried to approach some donors, but they knew they wouldn't get it. So that, that was, there was a bit of ambiguity about actually whether they've ever tried to seek the Western donor funding. This seems to, um, to touch on so, sort of one of the major themes of the book, which is uh, these, these um, organizations and NGOs having very low um, con uh, political context of the, the places that they're coming into and offering these trainings and offering the, the, this money to, um, and in what you've described so far about speaking to the women in, in the, Palestinian, um, the Palestinian women's sector, it sounds like what you're talking about is uh, pretty much organizations coming in and, and barging in and having no idea what, the, what work had been done and by whom up until that point. Mm -hmm. And so the trainings and the, the et cetera, that they're offering, it seems kind of missed the mark a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so could you expand a little bit on that? And maybe we can also use this to segue into talking about El Salvador as well. Um, segue into uh, talking about why, why and how these organizations with their trainings missed the mark um, and what perhaps maybe what your theories are of about why that context was missed and how how it was misapplied in in their in their efforts. Excellent, that's an excellent question. Um, in terms of the the donors I examined and the donor programs, I looked. I focused on bilateral state sponsored donors, um, and I looked. I examined them in the Palestinian case and the Salvadoran case, and then I looked at also smaller like foundations um, and smaller donors. Um, and what I found, and this is interesting, is that there, there is tremendous sometimes variation between the donors, but also very importantly, 
um, many of the people working in these offices often are experts and they, they really understand um, what's happening. I mean, some of the, some of the people were, that, who worked with USAID, and you could criticize USAID for all sorts of things, but some of the people working in um, the, like uh, overseeing um, democracy assistance to Palestinian territories knew Palestine intimately. And they, they, knew, they knew everything, they knew about this history, what have you. Um, however, for, some, for all sorts of reasons, this expertise, which was quite commendable, was not translated into the programming. And so you found this, um, there was variation. I mean, some of the smaller donors um, definitely appreciated and understood the context um, in which they were operating. But I do think with training, training is, e is, 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 is a major component of democracy promotion assistance. It's easy, it's quantifiable. And so it usually is, or was part of these democracy promotion programs. But certainly, um, and if I were, if, if um, policymakers were to ask me about what my recommendation would be, it would be to definitely understand the context in which you operate. And also, um, not only the political context, but these nuances and understanding, appreciating these significant histories, what the Palestinians were able to achieve um, you know, in, in the 1980s leading up to the Intifada in terms of mass mobilization is, is, is tremendous. Similarly in El Salvador. And I think now we, we, we tend, uh, you know, memory, we forget quickly and we, we tend to forget um, the kind of efforts that it took to mobilize, that it takes to mobilize entire societies this way. Um, I think in El Salvador, um, there was perhaps a bit, a bit more um, the flexibility. The aid was less political. That having been said, there, there was this kind of training in El Salvador and some of the women uh, didn't think it was the most effective. Um, but just from my interviews, there seemed to be, um, there, 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 the women were less dismayed um, in the Salvadoran context, although some of them said, you know, sometimes this is not useful, we had to move to more productive uh, programming, for example, in terms of women's, uh, you know, skills training. Um, but it seemed, I think, with Palestine, the aid effort was much larger, and this is easy. So this training was far more prevalent than it was in the Salvadoran case. What I don't understand, Manal, is that, you know, in the context of Palestine, you had a long uh, experience with aid um, allocations for democracy promotion and you had you know USA presence on the ground field workers they were observing the results over time why um, you know is this just a structural problem um, that that you know really can't be resolved at that on that level because of the fact there are certain there are certain um, you know, higher level administrators that are making these decisions and regardless of what the outcomes are on the ground, regardless of them being counterproductive, they're going to continue as they are because I'm sure these conversations were taking place on the ground between the field workers for the USAID and and the women that were the beneficiaries are supposed to be the, the beneficiaries of this aid. What was your conversations like with the um, folks, at, you know, administering the programs? They, I mean, no one came and told me uh, we, we are, we don't, we oppose, oppose our programs, right? But I did ask them and I would speak to them about like, you know, well, I, I, I you know, I have these interviews, of course, you know, I wouldn't tell them who I'm having the interviews with. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of dissatisfaction and people are unhappy with these programs and they, they understood. Um, but I, my sense um, very clearly was there was, I mean, what, what's happening in the offices in Tel Aviv and people overseeing the aid effort in the Palestinian territories, um, they're not the ones calling the exact shots. I mean, the decisions are coming from elsewhere. And so there definitely is that, um, th these, uh, this disconnect. Also, very importantly, um, is that there are changes that do take place over time. Um, you know, they, they try to, um, at some point, there's a bit of less focus on the training and they set up like, for example, the welfare associations programs where they're really giving smaller amounts of aid 
um, to, to a, a far larger number of grassroots organi organizations, and they're really trying not to be political. Um, and you could say that program, for example, was much more successful. So there are changes taking place, um, but the changes are far too slow. Um, and I'm not sure to what extent they're still appreciating um, the, 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 um, the, the the significant histories of the place they're operating. But my sense is, and I think it was very clear, it's more than a sense, that the decisions are not being made in the field offices. I'd like to take a second to interject and remind our viewers that we are having a Q&A at the end of this event. So if you have any questions for our two guests tonight, please feel free to put them in the comment section of the video that you're watching now. Thank you. I'd also like to follow up with a question, um, and this can be sort of a segue into the broader discussion between the two of you, if you feel uh, comfortable to move into that. Um, but uh, my question is regarding uh, regarding these aid organizations and sort of the concept of, of aid from the West uh, to begin with, uh, how much do you see the sort of politicized influence of the West's aims in these regions uh, reflected in the in the aid programs that uh, that you've observed. Um, and that's that's the um, that's an excellent question, and it's what I try I get at in the book is that the, this these aid efforts are very politicized, and pol the aid to Palestine was very politicized, and so the main focus in Palestine was not to promote democracy; it was to promote a political agreement, the Oslo Accords. Um, that would be to the benefit of Israel and to the benefit of um, to the to, to um, the United States. Um, and I'm looking at our time. Time is moving quickly. And Zaha um, is an amazing, excellent position um, to also comment on this question because she is doing, um, uh, yeah, she's doing some amazing work um, on um, you know policy recommendations now um, to. Um, in terms of what's happening to the aid effort to the Palestinian territories. And I think she can speak um, to this issue right now. I mean, the Biden administration is um, promising to change their democracy promotion efforts and to focus more on human rights. Um, and that, you know, to be less political, um, we'll wait and see if that's going to, to happen. But I think Zaha has a lot to say about um, what happened under the Trump administration, how politicized aid became there, um, uh, and then also um, some of the changes we might expect or some you know, recommendations um, that she and others are making. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Mel. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, things you know did change, um, but as much as they changed, uh, the more they stayed the same, I, I would say about um, aid um, from the US to Palestinians. Um, I think all aid, all bilateral aid, at least between the US and the Palestinians was severed completely by President Trump, but really, um, you know, uh, with the Biden administration now in office, we're seeing a revival of this idea of um, restarting uh, bilateral assistance and re-establishing bilateral relationships. Um, but um, it's going to be very difficult because of the nature of um, the Israel-Palestine conflict and because of the closeness and the special relationship the U.S. has with Israel and the ways in which the relationship with Palestinians is filtered through the peace process. Um, with the Trump administration, aid to Palestinians became directly linked to whether or not um, the Palestinian leadership would engage on Trump's deal of the century, which looked like, you know, terms for Palestinian surrender rather than a peace plan. The deal was a series of no's to Palestinians. They would have no sovereignty over their land, no return for Palestinian refugees to their former homes and property located in what became the state of Israel. Um, and there would be, um, you know, no removal of any of the illegal settlements that had been, um, you know, uh, populating the occupied West Bank. These are Jewish only colonies uh, in the West Bank. And there would be um, no recognition of Palestinian indigeneity even. Palestinians had to first recognize Israel and parts of the West Bank, including Jerusalem, 
that the U.S. wanted to see annexed to Israel as the national homeland of the Jewish people. So of course, Palestinians would not accept to engage with the U.S. on these terms. So aid to them and to the U.N. agency serving Palestinian refugees was completely cut off. Not only that, but the PLO was forced to close their mission in the U.S. and their representatives were um, chased out of the country. Now we're seeing, seeing a different approach now with the Biden administration. It has said that regardless of any movement on the peacemaking front, which is really stalled at the present time, it intends to reopen the PLO mission in the U.S., reestablish a U.S. consulate um, in Jerusalem that would serve Palestinians as if it was an embassy. And it, uh, the Biden administration has said that they want to restart bilateral assistance. Unfortunately, these goals are easier said than done because of the con of certain congressional restrictions on aid to Palestinians and laws that have been put in place in the last few years that would bankrupt the Palestinian um, national institutions with damages for dismissed terrorism cases worth like $650 million. So Palestinians for their part are moving ahead with renewal of their national bo bodies and institutions and they're not really waiting for, um, you know, for uh, the bilateral relationship to, to be uh, back online. In May, they're planning to have their first legislative elections for the Palestinian Authority, which governs the Palestinian territories. The last legislative elections were held in 2006, so they are way long overdue. There's going to be PA presidential elections um, in July, uh, or at least planned and then elections for the PLO parliament, which seats Palestinians both from inside the Palestinian territories and from the diaspora, and that should take place in August. Unfortunately, uh, we're gonna run up to the same kinds of problems Manal uh, talks about in her book, which, I mean, these elections will be pro forma and meant to appease the US, uh, which is the, you know, which is calling for the elections and for Palestinian political renewal. And it's meant to also, you know, play to the international donor community who want to see Gaza and the West Bank united again under one authority before continuing to provide um, financial assistance to Palestinians. The Hamas authority in Gaza needs the aid to rebuild the Strip, which has been devastated by a series of, you know, um, uh, conflicts with Israel, violent conflicts with, and confrontations with Israel, but it can't get uh, that uh, donor assistance unless it reconciles with Fatah. And Fatah, for its part, also can't re-engage completely with the U.S. and relaunch peace talks unless it reconciles with, um, with uh, the Hamas Authority in Gaza and it won't be able to get aid into the West Bank as well. So um, for everyone to get what they want, uh, Hamas has to has agreed to field a joint list of, of its members with Fatah members for the legislative elections. The government would be one of technocrats um, because of congressional restrictions around having a Hamas having Hamas in a government. So there wouldn't be the trigger of these laws. Um, Hamas has also agreed not to run a presidential candidate to avoid any conflict again with U.S. laws. This really doesn't look like political renewal at the end of the day. It looks like an entrenchment of the current status quo. Um, and so it's skewing Palestinian uh, politics toward authoritarianism and autocracy. And this is you know, just more of the same of what Manal uh, describes in her book. Um, so it's really, it's really unfortunate that you know, uh, donor assistance has, has not played at well at all, at least in the Palestinian context. Sorry, having a little bit of trouble unmuting there. Uh, so what you bring up is a really uh, great link to, to the present day and sort of a context to bring this discussion into um, what we're dealing with, at least from the US point of view uh, especially under the administration we've been <laughs> dealing with for the, the past couple of years. But I wonder if you have thoughts on how, um, how what you've just described, how that reflects in some of the, the US's history of sort of doing the same thing, destabilizing and then interjecting uh, US interests um, into what they, would, what they would like to call, or I'll, I'll say uh, the restabilization of of the political uh, sector in, in certain regions of the world. For example, 
um, Cuba and Argentina come to mind. And I wonder if you have um, some thoughts about that, uh, either of you. And I also have a question from the queue after after this. I, I mean, I have a, a, a comment, and especially relates to democracy promotion. Um, and also it relates to, to the point, the very important point that, that you raised and the role that the United States has played in undermining democracy in many parts of the world. I think this moment um, is a moment of reckoning and what the United States needs to do and what many established democracies need to do is recognize that liberal democracy and their democracies are also in crisis. Um, and so um, it is, it's very timely for the United States and other established democracies um, to, to humble themselves and also to approach the whole democracy promotion and, uh, enterprise um, in, in, in a much more, uh, in, a, in a much more, um, you know, humble way. Um, and so I do think that's where the democracy promotion enterprise should go. Um, I also think there, there should be greater recognition that the way we've understood democracy simply with this focus on, um, on liberal democracy, um, I think it needs to change. And there needs to be greater recognition of you know, people's real grievances um, at this moment, at this historical moment. Um, it, it, these grievances are related to issues of you know, inequality. They are related to issues of socioeconomic grievances. And these grievances cannot be divorced um, from people's grievances related to democratic participation. Thank you so much. Um, we're, we're coming up on our time. So I'm gonna move us into our Q&A here and remind anyone watching right now that you have a few more minutes to, to submit some questions to our guests tonight uh, via the chat underneath the, the live stream that you're watching right now. Our first question is from Yassim uh, and he says, thinking about cases other than Palestine and El Salvador, could Professor Jamal perhaps give us an example where the result the results resembled that of El Salvador and says, thank you for this wonderful talk and discussion. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, well, I, actually one of the cases I actually discuss in the, in the book is um, South Africa. And as I had mentioned, um, in South Africa, you do have an inclusive political process. Um, and then there, when there is this influx of aid, there is um, the aid uh, comes in all different groups have the same access, not all, I shouldn't say, the, the, and the uh, former uh, pro-apartheid groups don't have the same access, but they're, they're not involved in the same way um, at the civil society level. But the different organizations um, have the same access to foreign aid. And also um, even more so than the Salvadoran case, um, the ANC was very specific about like not accepting conditional aid. Um, so that, that's definitely another more inclusive case. Unfortunately, in the Middle East cases, we find that aid often was much more politicized and there's much more emphasis on um, determining certain outcomes and, and you know, democratic outcomes in those cases. So I don't think we'll find those cases in the Middle East to the same extent. Thank you. Um, Right now, we don't have any other questions, but if you'd like to expand a little bit more on, um, as we were talking about a moment ago, the, uh, the, the, the continued politicization, if that's the appropriate word. Um, and I think the two of you both could have um, good commentary here. Maybe we can use this as our sort of closing moment, um, the, just the politicization of, of uh, aid, of, of overseas works, of, um, even media as it goes on and maybe just uh, give a few closing remarks about that. Well, is that how you would like to go? Uh, I could just, I mean, I'll, I'd rather hear from you honestly than myself, but I, what I will note is that, you know, I, I think um, at least in this, this new administration, there's an understanding that the US needs to like back off a little bit, <laughs> at least in the Middle East. Um, and, and recognizing that we have work to do at home. So there is a sense of more humility um, 
in this new administration. And there's also, um, as a result of sort of this moment of racial reckoning, that you know our domestic uh, policy and our aspirations for ourselves need to be reflected also in our priorities um, in the foreign policy realm. So you know we can't just simply um, talk about um, you know equality in the U.S. and um, you know these universal values and then go off to countries abroad and skew skew um, you know outcomes there in a way that are anti-democratic in ways that um, deny people um, equality before the law. And I think. In the context of Israel Palestine, this is going to come to a to a head, <laughs> because we we're at a uh, we're in a situation now in Palestine where we are there is an undeniable apartheid taking place, both inside the occupied territories and inside Israel. The largest human rights organization inside Israel has now declared Israel is an apartheid state. We have Israel constitutionalizing the idea that. Only Jewish people are entitled to self-determination wherever Israel extends its sovereignty. And in this case where we have a U.S. that has this special relationship with Israel and talks about its relationship as one based on shared values, what is that going to mean moving forward in terms of, um, you know, the U.S. engagement in the Middle East, in terms of the U.S. relationship to Palestinians and, and the U.S. relationship to the government of Israel? So, um, I'm going to be watching for that um, with this new administration and seeing how all of that plays out. Um, but I'd love to hear Manel's thoughts on other parts of um, the world. I mean, I think, well, I, I'll focus on the U.S. I mean, the Biden administration has, um, has indicated that they will be focusing more on human rights and that there is this, there will be this effort to align um, you know, their foreign policies related to democracy promotion um, with, with the principles that, that they, they um, uphold. And we will be watching carefully. Um, my wish though also is that there will be um, greater attention to understanding the societies in which they work um, because, um, you know, not understanding these societies intimately and the strengths and what people were able to to accomplish you know over decades um, really does undermine any you know external efforts um, and very importantly sometimes you know less is more so I, I hope that'll be something um, that that the administration will also keep in mind in their approach and let's not forget all the damage that has to be done um, undone from the Trump administration. I mean, under the Trump administration related to uh, democracy promotion, entire new budgets were set up actually for that were just politicized about supporting certain groups or religious groups in certain contexts and really were about with the explicit, um, you know, intention of, of increasing polarization and divisions in these societies. So there is a lot of work to be done, but I do, um, I, I, I think we do need to hold this administration um, to account to their wish to align um, their, their democracy promotion efforts with, with the prim principles they claim to uphold. And so we'll, we'll wait and see. Thank you both so much. Um, I think we're, we're approaching time now, but I would love to thank you both so much for being here tonight um, and remind our viewers that uh, Promoting Democracy is available at Lost City Books. So if you're curious to learn more about the things we've discussed tonight, or you'd like to expand on your understanding uh, that you might already have, this is an excellent opportunity to do that. Um, I would like to thank you, Dr. Jamal and Zaha, please, um, definitely stay in touch with us. And if you'd like to, um, if our viewers would like to find your work in the future, uh, can we close with a little, a way to, to, to find you in the future after this? Um, my work uh, on just, I'm a professor at James Madison University. So you Google me and um, my information is there and my research uh, is readily, like a lot of my publications are available in, um, in terms of articles online. Um, but the book, please, you know, you could buy it from um, uh, Lost City Books or from NYU Press directly. 
And you can find me on the Carnegie Endowment website. Um, just search for me under experts and my writings are there. And in the next um, couple of weeks, we'll be coming out with a, a uh, policy recommendations to the Biden administration on how to approach Israel-Palestine peace and um, the relationship with Palestinians. So I hope you all will check that out. Absolutely. Thank you both so much. And we have been Lost City Books. This has been Promoting Democracy. And I'll bid you both good night. Thank, Thank you, Shady. You. You're Thank great. You. Thank you, Shady. <laughs> Thank you, Zaha. Good night, everyone. Thanks for now. Bye. Bye.